if what you are publishing is material. And in the case that, in the study that Ingmar Reidel Cruz and uh, Paolo Blickstein have done, what they are publishing is biologically active substances. So a new twist on Publish on Demand, uh, Professor Reidel Cruz from Bioengineering teamed with uh, Paolo Blickstein in the Graduate School of Education. Uh, Ingmar loves games. He's created a platform for biology games um, uh, called Biotic Games. And uh, in this uh, experiment, they employ a kind of learning that is called hybrid learning. Ingmar. Welcome. Uh, exciting meeting. Um, so my lab, uh, one of the interests we have is basically how do we as humans uh, can interact with microbiological processes. So we all see kind of these big plants and we and animals and whatever on a daily basis, but there's much more that we don't see, right? Microorganisms you have in your hand, in your gut, and then whatever. And so it raises the question, how can we interact with those? Should we? Uh, and so forth. And we are kind of interested in in kind of making interfaces uh, to do that and then also um, apply them to meaningful applications. And so one of the things that you see here is kind of indicated is also this joystick. So as Martha said, we also made some games, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. But what the two arrows signal is basically you really want to have a two-way communication uh, of some sort. And what I'm going to talk today primarily about is how can we make interfaces um, with the kind of devices uh, we now increasingly have to run experiments and uh, primarily over the over the web. So that's what I'm going to talk today about. How can we do cloud experimentation? How can you basically sit in front of your computer and do experiments with uh, microbiological systems? So why do we want to do that? Um, there are multiple reasons for that, and just name a few. Um, we talked a lot about like online education, um, big hype, and one of the things that is really missing is kind of real labs, right? I mean, you can't do experiments. And uh, what we're interested in is how can we basically deliver biology experiments at large scale um, in these kind of uh, educational settings? There are other things, like I personally come from physics originally. There are many uh, people who do theoretical biology. They would like to do experiments, but they can't because it's hard to run a bad lab. But we know from cloud computation, you can actually have um, servers where you can do computation. Why aren't we doing the same uh, with, uh, with experiments? And then there's also more practical aspects in, in, the, in the life sciences. We have increasingly more high-throughput equipment, which is very expensive, somehow uh, centrally localized. And uh, why can't we open this up instead of one person running 100,000 experiments in one of these machines? Why not having 100,000 people running one experiment each? Right? Those are the kind of questions uh, we ask. And what I want to uh, tell you today is, is kind of some rather small-scale prototypes and what we can do with those, primarily in, in, in education. So the first example I'm going to uh, talk about is uh, about uh, Fusarum. It's an, it's an organism, a slime mold, which you see here. So this is a petri dish, for those who don't know. And kind of the scale, here's a couple of centimeters, and the whole movie is running uh, about a day. And what you should see here is in yellow is this organism, which kind of grows in the dish, okay? And what you see in uh, kind of grayish is basically where food has been dropped. And you can do this kind of experiments by hand, by pipetting by hand, and you see how basically this organism initially explores, but then over time kind of really follows this food. Now, um, the slight twist here is that this actually has not been done by uh, pipetting by hand. It has actually been done online uh, via a, a web interface. And uh, um, how this basically works is uh, we have some web interfaces, either by our phone or kind of standard web browser. We have a robot, uh, which you build out of Lego, um, that basically has a bunch of these uh, petri dishes and, and drops food on it. And what you get back as a user is... Um, uh, your experiments. And I try to, so I really sped this thing up. So this is the website where basically the students can log on, choose an experiment, um, then choose uh, what kind of food and how fast they want to lay it, and they lay out a trail of food, right, submit uh, that, and then all this uh, information gets sent uh, to, to our robots, um, which are then basically execute as experiments. Uh, the reason we use Lego is, is twofold. One, it's easy to prototype. The other thing is, as was mentioned before, there's certain robotics competitions. We could envision how kids in the future do these, build these things themselves, right? Then we have a scanner here which takes those images, like every 10 minutes. And then you can, these images are basically put in the database, and the student can log on uh, frequently, kind of look how the experiment is going, and uh, put further um, food stimuli uh, on there, right? So here again, uh, the web interface, most students uh, kind of use this one, but we made it such that you can also use it uh, from a phone. Um, yeah, you have some 
the main thing is, main features, you can really um, basically see your experiment, uh, scroll back and forth, um, decide where you want to drop the food. We also have some zoom-in features, so you can really have close-up looks of, of how this uh, growth is happening in small uh, detail and so forth. We even had some chat features so students could talk to each other. Um, the robot, I said, like is basically made out of Lego Mindstorm with a flatbed scanner, and the Raspberry Pi is kind of controlling the whole thing. Um, so then we used this uh, last quarter in a Stanford class that I teach in uh, modeling bio uh, uh, multicellular systems. And so we had uh, the students run throughout the class experiments. So each student did about uh, 20 of, of those experiments. And here's the, a bunch of those experiments that they have done. And what you kind of primarily can see is the, the different blue dots. You see uh, what different things uh, students tried. So a couple of those tried things like if you put two different uh, blobs of food, where does the uh, organism decide to go? Some students did very long trails, others tried all sorts of things, right, uh, different sizes. Other people, other students didn't put any food, just, just watched. And, um, and so the students uh, um, then did also final projects, so we asked them to model things. And this is kind of one example uh, uh, what one of uh, the, the students did. Here's kind of the raw data looking at different sizes of these um, uh, uh, organisms and try to capture what are kind of the different form factors that you get, um, kind of these fractal patterns. And then the student did quite some modeling uh, of trying to capture, think about different models that would be more or less realistic um, uh, to what has been done, uh, what is seen in the experiment, and it also makes some, some quantitative experiment. So and the key feature here is really that a student can basically have a lab experience, but without having to actually physically doing any lab work. Right? So. Um, another nice feature is that we can actually log all the user data, right? We know every click, we know when they zoomed in, whatever they did. And we can use this then to do learning analytics. And so here's one example um, of a snapshot uh, of what uh, such learning analytics looks like. So what you see here is the time axis basically over this 10 weeks period of, of the course. What you see here is, is basically each experiment um, that were done successively. This is the data for one particular student. Each of these green bars is basically the duration of, of one experiment, right? And so you see basically these were the first experiments, three experiments in parallel, another two, then they were done four experiments, and so forth, right? And then what you see kind of the, the ticks here is, is whenever the student logged on and did, did something, and students did a lot, so we can really zoom in what they actually did there. Um, and the blue bar usually goes until the last time they ever looked into this experiment. Right? What you can see here, for example, for this particular student is usually had this pattern whenever he did kind of a next run of experiment, he looked kind of at the last few experiments, but never really looked far back, also here, right? I mean, did these three experiments look at these, but never looked at back at those. We also have kind of uh, opened it up that the students can look at other students' experiments, so that's shown here. And you see that this student at some point looked at some other experiments, right? So this is kind of a snapshot of user behavior, which you could analyze in, in much more detail, which I can't go into detail, but just to show you, um, the example for four different students, right? Kind of the same snapshot, and you should right away see some very obvious uh, differences. For example, this was the student I just showed you, right? Uh, which, as I said, usually did not look back at other experiments, but all these other students usually really looked often back at what they have done even weeks ago, right? Another feature is this student, for example, really looked a lot at other people's data. All the others did not as much. This student here really, I mean, as you see with all these, these purple graphs, really uh, studied all his own experiments extremely carefully, right? So very different user behaviors. And the funny thing is, I mean, the students were graded, and we did the analysis after the, um, after the course. And kind of what you see here also reflects a little bit the overall course grade. So kind of the students really put lots of effort in what you see here, um, put also lots of effort in, in, in other uh, 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 parts of the course. But... Um, so it's really powerful, not only for, for teaching, and, um, but also for, for learning research. I mean, you're still kind of analyzing uh, that data. And I want to give you a second uh, uh, example of this kind of online um, uh, experimentation system. So what I showed you so far was something when an experiment basically lasts a day, and um, you get an image every 10 minutes. So what about an in, in interaction which is kind of real time, and which maybe lasts only a minute? And so uh, the organisms we use here... Uh, your glana is kind of single cell organisms that are 50 micrometers long. You have them in your pond. Uh, and uh, so the interface we built here is that we have a, a chamber where you have all these uh, organisms swimming. And then we have a joystick here which you can pull. And this joystick actually shines light, uh, actuates light from a certain size. And if you shine light for a while, you should uh, appreciate that then all these organisms uh, move uh, in one direction. Right? 
And if you now change the direction of the joystick, then you can make the move in other directions, of course. And so you have a real-time interaction um, uh, uh, with these organisms. And we didn't really make this into a game yet, but you can see here, for example, a box. We can say, like, I mean, try to get the box to the other side where the box kind of tracks the flow uh, of, of these organisms. Right? So I think it's really apparent uh, how they follow the, the stimulus. So here's the, the basic uh, setup, uh, the joystick, um, as I just showed you. Um, the chamber is basically schematized here by four LEDs, which uh, can be turned on and off, kind of in an analog fashion. And that's what the thing actually looks in real. I'm not sure whether you get much out of it, but it's basically like a chamber of a size of about a, a, a centimeter. Um, so very simple. The main thing here is that we've uh, found an organism that really lives in, in this kind of chamber for, for weeks very happily, and we have a very robust and, and, and affordable uh, system. Um, Kind of the, the overall schematics is you can use a standard microscope, have this little chamber here, and then use an Arduino to kind of control it either locally or, or over the web. Okay? Um, if you now do this just uh, with different uh, zoom levels in the microscope, right, you can look at very different features. This is what we saw. I mean, you can really look at high levels and see subcellular uh, details. So I'm not sure whether this is, uh, is visible on, um, uh, with the lighting conditions here, but there are actually dirt particles in here which kind of show you the whole flow field uh, of, uh, of the surrounding medium, and you can even um, detect Brownian motions. There are lots of details what students could study and, and discover um, while interacting with that kind of uh, interface. Right? Um, and um, there's also all sorts of other things that grows in there. It's kind of a little micro-ecosystem, so there are other organisms you can discover. So for example, Botticella, if you zoom in, you can see bacteria and kind of these tracer particles. Um, that are also, also mentioned. So, very rich experience, and this is kind of the next thing we're going to use in, in another class. And so, let me come to the conclusion here. So, what I talked to you about today is um, we're interested in kind of human biology interaction. How can we enable um, people all ages um, to interact with these microscopic uh, um, systems? Um, the primary thing today was about doing this over the cloud, but you can also do it locally and, and with other uh, kind of um, approaches. And the two different things here was this was really kind of a long-term um, experiment lasting a couple of hours, while this one is just really kind of uh, quick pace. And the applications for this, um, I mean, there are multiple ones. Um, teaching and learning analytics are those that I've tried to highlight today, but in the future we can also think about life science research. So, for example, some theoretician logging on, running the experiments, downloading data and analyzing it, maybe in the future even open it up uh, for citizen science. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.